not announce I'm still struggling with my asthma, but now I guess I don't have much choice. So for please uh, give me just a little bit of grace. Thanks for the extra volume because I don't have it in here. Welcome to worship this ninth weekend of Pentecost. Our sermon theme, we're going to continue to take a look at the parables that we have been doing for the last several weeks. So we'll be asking the question, what is your most valuable hidden treasure or what is your most valuable pearl that you have? And we'll be looking at that question from a couple of different perspectives before we finally get around to the answer. Also, in our prayers of the church, we'll remember, of course, our baptismal anniversaries but also Pastor Fouts and Mr. Whitney, who are away at uh, Synodical Convention taking care of the business of the Synod and for the church. And so and then we'll pray for them as well. And uh, Karen Ritterbush is also hospitalized at this time after having surgery earlier this week in Omaha. She's in, in uh, the hospital at Faith Regional. So I invite you to please stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we gather for worship together. In the name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This time I invite the congregation to share the peace.
God's beloved, let us before, come before God our Father with repentant hearts and confess our sins to him, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that he grant forgiveness to us. For God's word says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for silent reflection. Together we confess. God of mercy, I know that I am sinful by nature. I sin against you in what I think, say, and do, in ways that I know and in ways of which I am unaware. I often bury my hidden treasure, forsaking it for the other things of lesser value, neglecting the hidden treasure given to me in Jesus. Ask for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, to forgive me for this and for all the ways in which I have done wrong against you. Upon hearing your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and by the command of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The congregation may be seated for our next hymn, Just As I Am, hymn number 570.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray the collect of the day as printed on the screen. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading that greets us this ninth weekend of Pentecost comes from Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord has set his love on you and chose you. For you were actually the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, with whose love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle that greets us this day is from Romans, the eighth chapter. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall then separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus said... The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. 
And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of our Lord. The congregation may be seated, and this time we invite Mrs. Ann and our fourth grade teacher and all of our young children forward for our children's message. Good. All righty. Well, I was pretty excited when I got the readings for today because I have something up here. It's just always really hard to know where to stand when you do these things. Okay, I have something right here. Do you guys see what's in front of me? A treasure box. I love a good treasure box. I think that's the teacher in me too, okay? So should we open it up and see what's inside of it? Okay. All right. You guys see? Well, I probably at this time, just because there's so many of you, which I love to see, won't let you dig through it. Yeah, there's treasure inside there, okay? All right. See? There we go. Kind of some fake, some fake uh, jewels. Yeah, we can, we can hold it up so people can see. You know, some good old Sunday school storage material right here. Well, what is something you treasure? What is something that you treasure? It could be something that, that you have, or it could be somebody in your life. Oh, you even raise your hand. What's something you treasure? Coin. Coins. Okay. What's something you treasure? God. God. What's something you treasure? God. Very good. What's something you treasure? Jesus. Jesus. What's something you treasure? Jesus and God. Your family, sometimes it's tangible things. Like maybe you treasure, you have a collection, so you treasure all your Legos. Or is that what you were going to say? What were you going to say? I have a, a, like a sort of rare toy in my house. And so that's something you treasure, right? Well, the Old Testament reading today was one that I just really, really love. Because sometimes, do you know, I don't always feel like much of a treasure. Sometimes I feel like kind of those leftover socks in the side of my living room. And sometimes it's hard when those socks don't have matches. They feel kind of left out. But do you know what the Bible says about you? I also have something you're going to take with you when you're done. Okay? So you got to hold out for that. It says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Jesus loves you so much, even on the days that you don't feel like treasure. Do you want to hold that for me? She's one of your youngest friends, so we're going to let her hold it. He treasures you that much because the Bible says so. He loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you on the cross. And so there's going to be days where you feel like the leftover socks in my living room. And so you have to go back to this, because this holds the truth. And so both Deuteronomy and the gospel lesson talk about what a treasured possession you are. And it's not because of what the TV says about you or your friends. It's because of what God says about you, okay? We're going to pray, and then I'll ask a couple of my older, my older kiddos up here. I have um, little tattoo stickers. They're really old. I found them in my desk. I don't even know if they stick anymore. But they're sparkly, and they have a message on there about how much Jesus loves you. And you can take that back with you, okay? Say, I am a treasured possession because of Jesus. All right, will you guys fold your hands with me and repeat after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Help me remember I am your treasured possession. Amen. All right. I see a couple of, you guys, fifth, sixth, fifth graders. Sixth graders, jeez. Oh, a 
couple of my sixth grade friends or high school friends can help me pass these stickers out, okay? All right, then after you get your sticker, you can head back. As our kiddos and their parents are returning their seats, I invite the congregation to please stand and we'll confess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Thank you, Mrs. Onan. You just ended our, our service except for the prayers. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the adult message. What's your most valuable hidden treasure or pearl? You've already been given the answer, but we're still going to go through this text because we have some other things to kind of talk about as well. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, Jesus. Amen. As I said at the outset, we continue our journey through some of Matthew's parables, which, have been, which we've been doing for the last several weeks before getting into the depth of the meaning of today's parable. Mrs. Onan already gave you the answer to the proverbial Rubik's Cube or puzzle that this text prevents, presents us with. And in the hidden purpose, we must ask ourselves what our most valuable treasure or pearl is. So I want to ask, pretend you didn't hear what Mrs. Onan had to say, and let's ask this question from a couple of different perspectives. First, if your family member asks you what's your most valuable or hidden treasure, how would you answer that question? For some of you, it may be your very family, a family heirloom, a favorite toy, either child or adult-sized toy, perhaps a favorite vehicle or a new pickup for the farm, maybe it's a boat or an RV, or maybe it's your sports memorabilia from your glory days. Maybe it's your marriage itself or the memories you have created with your family or maybe it's even the education you received at a Lutheran school. So now let's look at that same question, but answered from, asked from a different perspective. How would you answer that question if your banker or insurance agent asked you, what is your most valuable possession or most valuable pearl? Does the fact that your banker or insurance agent change the answer to your questions? 
For some of us, it might. We might be more likely inclined to enlist investments or other financial assets. But would you still include those things when you were asked the question the first time? So now let us consider that same question as asked by a called church worker or a Sunday school teacher. That definitely changes our answer. And in many cases, we'll say things like our baptismal certificate or our confirmation verse. Memories of being educated in a Lutheran school. Maybe the Bible that you got at Bible Arrival in the second grade or your first teen or adult Bible. But now you're getting a little warmer as we search for our most valuable treasure. And as Mrs. Onan's already told us, we are the treasured possession of Jesus. We'll get back to that in a moment, though. A few weeks ago, Pastor Fouch preached on how the Word of God does not return empty. He also talked about planting seeds of faith in that same sermon. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are a portion of the proof that God's word does not return empty. Your baptisms and your faith journeys are some of the many pieces of evidence of the truth that God's word does not return empty. You are the living fruit and proof of that truth. We'll look closer at the hidden treasure and the pearl parables. There are some parallels there in these two brief parables, but there are also some significant differences. A quick survey or study of the historical record showing the meanings of these two parables suggests that the meaning of the parable is the cost of discipleship. The man who finds a hidden treasure sells everything that he has in order to purchase the field which the treasure is hidden in. In the other parable, the merchant man searches the world over to find the most valuable pearl that he can find. And when he does, he gets rid of or sells everything else that he has in order to obtain this pearl. However, there is one very significant theological with this problem, with this understanding. And virtually all the Christian scholars retreat from it when pushed to the issue. And that issue is that no one wants to say that these parables that teach that humans can purchase Christ, reign, or anything else for their salvation. So as I searched further, I came upon what Reverend Dr. Gibbs, a retired professor from Cordia Seminary, had to say about this, these parables. He says there must be yet another explanation for the question in the parables. And he says, Jesus, Jesus demonstrates this in another kingdom parable later on in Matthew's gospel. When the rich young ruler comes and tells Jesus that he has done everything that there is to do to fulfill the law and the prophets, Jesus looks at him and he says, young man, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. If you know the parable I'm referring to, you know sadly that the rich young man walks away spiritually destitute and depraved with all of his earthly possessions intact because he's unable to let go of the things that God has given him and he clings to and holds on to his earthly possessions rather than the pearl of Christ's salvation. So the correct answer to these parables is that they are a portion of the kingdom parables found in Matthew's gospel, and therefore they have Christ-centered or Christological meanings. That answer agrees with Scripture, our Lutheran confessions, and our teaching. We know that we cannot purchase our salvation. As the Holy Spirit instructed the Apostle Paul to write and to say, and Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance or beforehand for us to do. Thus, a Christological understanding is the correct understanding and makes sense because it is God in the person of Jesus who does the actions. He is the one who goes out and purchases salvation for us, his creation. A Christological explanation of these two parables shows us that Jesus has come to do. Both of the above parables with a Christ-centered understanding make sense when Jesus is that central figure who goes and does the action of exchanging and purchasing on our behalf. You know that he exchanged his body and his blood, which we'll partake of here in a few moments. And he took on our sinfulness and gave us his righteousness. So then the impact of these two parables upon Jesus' disciples and his children is primarily one of assurance and encouragement for the difficult life of discipleship that we face during the time that we look forward to the return of Jesus. Listen to one more passage from Acts chapter 3. A crippled man from birth is a beggar. And as Peter and John passed by, he asked them for some money. And Peter replies, silver or gold, I have none. I do not have but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up. And as he takes the man by the right hand, and he helps him up, and instantly the man's ankles and feet and his knees become strong, and he leaps to his feet, jumping for joy and praising God that he has received this divine healing because he already has the gift of faith. And now he exercises his salvation and walks and tells everyone he knows what has been done for him in the name of Jesus. So all of that to say your most valuable and costly pearl is what Jesus of Nazareth has purchased for you, which is your salvation. You are God's treasured possession. So the most valuable treasure you have also comes from the Apostle Paul still inspired by the Holy Spirit which are these words and you also were included in the truth of the gospel your salvation having believed you were marked with a seal the promised Holy Spirit which is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory that Holy Spirit makes you the temple of the living God. You are Christ's living treasure. You are a baptized, called, and loved disciple. Isaiah says it this way in the 43rd chapter. I have called you by name. You are mine. I have redeemed you. Do not forget that when you go out those doors this week and the world slaps you in the face with everything it's going to throw at us to assault us as God's treasured possession. Until now, you have been given almost all gospel. However, God uses this weakened voice box in this place today to warn you not to cast your pearl before swine. That is to say, do not throw your gift of faith and salvation away. Do not turn your back on God and walk away from Him. And even when we do mess up and give in to our sin nature, He continually calls us and pursues us to return to Him, asking us and inviting us to repent and to turn from our sinful ways and restores you and I as His dearly beloved children. He purchased you with His very body and blood, so that he could call you his dear child, friend, disciple, righteous, pure, and holy, even as he is holy. What a truly blessed and beautiful gift that we have been given. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds until the day of Christ's return. Amen. We'll continue with our next hymn.
Congregation may be seated. This time we ask Hannah Fouts and Grace Vaisaki to come forward. And while they're doing that, you have before you the fruit of what a Lutheran education can and does for us. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Hannah Fouts and Grace Vaisaki, whose faith has been nurtured in, their, in this congregation through you, their teachers, their Sunday school teachers, and VBS, and of course, moms and dads, has been led to enter upon a course of study to prepare them to serve as Lutheran school teachers. As they begin their study, we look to the word of God for encouragement, strength, and guidance. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches, ladies, in, his, in her teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Hear these words also from the Apostle Paul in the third chapter of Colossians. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts. To God, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord, the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful Father, we give thanks for all blessings you have bestowed on Hannah and Grace, who have been moved to begin preparation for your work in your kingdom. By your Holy Spirit, grant them an open mind and heart to hear and to learn your holy word. Grant them the ability to serve you faithfully and effectively after their instruction is completed. Support, strengthen, and protect them during the years that lie ahead, so that by your word, your church may be built and increased. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ladies, go in peace. The Almighty and most merciful God, and Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and bless you and strengthen you for your faithful service in his name. Amen. And they go back to their seats. And as they return to their seats, I ask the congregation to please stand for the prayers of the church. We want to give a word of praise and thanks for all those who helped match the uh, debt match. We have raised $44,000 so far. So a huge praise to God. Also, as I said, Karen Ritterbush is at Faith Regional Hospital. We pray for her, for Pastor Fouts and Mr. Whitney at the convention and all the delegates there and those that are celebrating baptismal anniversaries. As before each petition will end, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have redeemed us out of your steadfast love. Grant that the gospel may go forth uninhibited and your spirit bring many into this fellowship of the redeemed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have revealed to us the true treasure of Christ's cross and resurrection. Grant that we may pursue your kingdom with all our hearts, souls, minds, and bodies. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you justify us for the sake of Christ. 
comfort any who are troubled by the memory of past sins or visited by the temptation to believe they cannot be forgiven. Give them confidence in Christ that he died for them and, for, and still intercedes for them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have given us various offices in our lives. Grant us faithfulness in these callings that we may see them as gifts through which we serve you and our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, thank you for granting us the hidden treasure of salvation and baptism through Christ Jesus. So we join with those who celebrate their baptismal anniversaries this week. Amanda Holacek, Craig Uncle, Adeline Henry, Jenny Lyon, Josh Spulek, Justin Eckert, Kellen Klug, Natasha Onan, Aidan Buckendall, Dennis Sherman, Greg Young, Lizzie Fouts, Rachel Stout, Rich Erickson, Ron Potter, Bella Huntley, Dennis Hoffman, Hallie Borchers, Cadiz Huntley, Richard Frank, Michael Mon, Jenny, and Jolene Zoner. Heavenly Father, bestow your comfort upon all who are burdened by sickness and affliction, especially Craig Nelson, Bud and Donna Rotocor, Carolyn Priner, Addie Sheeve, Neil Ackley, Ann Koopman, Alice Miller, Karen and Randy Bud Ritterbush, and Jane Warnke. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant that all who partake of Holy Communion today do so rejoicing that the Christ they receive in this sacrament also intercedes for them at your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, it is not for the sake of our numbers or strength or birth that you preserve us, but for the sake of your faithfulness and steadfast love. As you preserved your ancient people of Israel for the sake of your promises, keep your holy church on earth and also preserve our synod. We pray for Pastor Fouts, Mr. Whitney, and for all for the sake of your name who lead our delegates and members gathered in convention according to your good pleasure and will, that in word and deed we may love you and keep your commandments, confessing your steadfast love and faithfulness to a thousand generations through Christ the crucified who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the offering. At this time, I invite the acolytes and the ushers forward. Wherever he 
Congregation will please rise. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you eat it and drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
Hastings, please rise. Now may this true body and blood bless you and preserve you and keep you in the remembrance that you are Christ's treasured possession. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for a few upcoming announcements. Our first slide, please, folks. As I said, praise God, 44704 and 2 cents was raised as of last week, and I think you still have until the end of service today to increase that number if you so desire. Next slide, please, folks. Our reception for Hannah and Grace, where'd they go? I guess they're already in the back. Um, for everyone's invited, don't go out the back doors and take off for your summer, whatever you got. Go down and encourage Gr Hannah and Grace and give them some pearls of wisdom um, as they enter uh, Concordia, uh, River 4, Chicago for Hannah and Concordia Seward for Grace to begin their training as uh, Lutheran school teachers. Next slide, please. Back to school pool party. 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock tonight. Free will donation if you are able um, at the uh, pool down at the community park from 6 to 8. I'm sure that'll be a great time. Next slide, please. St. John K-8 registration Tuesday from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Baumgartel and all the teachers will be there looking forward to greet you and Mr. Onan and Mrs. Onan will be there as well. So uh, come and join and encourage our students as they enter a new school year. And when, is there any more slides? Is that it? Okay. The Lord bless, please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace. Amen. We'll continue with our last hymn. 